as a church. As I said earlier, today is Palm Sunday, and uh, apparently it is also allergy season here in Arkansas. Um, I never had any allergies to anything, and now I think I'm allergic to oxygen. Uh, just, just breathing seems to get to me. I feel great, uh, but I do have some sinus stuff going on in my throat. It sounds terrible. Uh, I actually kind of like the sound of it, but it doesn't, it, it's not comfortable, you know, like I like a little gravel in my voice, but, uh, but it's probably harder on your ears today. And so I'm going to try to keep the volume kind of dialed in. So Jeremy, you might need to bump me uh, back there. I'm going to try not to sniffle and cough and make disgusting sounds into the microphone, but I'm just going to apologize in advance because at some point I'm going to reach for my elbow and cough into it, or I'm going to make some sniffling sounds, especially for those of you on the live stream. I know that's always a special blessing to listen to me sniffle my way through a sermon. Uh, just quick side note, since I'm talking about sniffling, uh, when Nicole walked into the, uh, sanctuary, into the sanctuary for our wedding, I got misty-eyed and my nose started running. And my nose ran for our whole wedding. And of course, the wedding videographer had a, had a microphone on me. This is thousand years ago before we had live stream or any of that stuff. But when you watch our wedding video, the whole thing is me going... <laughs> And it sounds like I was a wreck for the whole service. And what was actually happening was I was trying not to get snot on my tuxedo is what I was, uh, is what I was actually doing in that, in that situation. Fortunately, snot on a denim jacket isn't quite so bad. I don't have to give it back to anybody. We'll just throw it in the washer if, uh, if we need to today. Man, weren't you, wasn't it great to have Pastor Gabe uh, joining us today? We're so excited. We've been anticipating your arrival for a long time. We're going to pray over Pastor Gabe and, uh, and Anna, and I don't know if the kids will join us for that. Don't have to, but if they're around, uh, we'll pray over them today as we close out this service. Just as kind of an act of installation for our congregation, but uh, man, we are, we're excited about the future and so glad to have you with us here, Gabe. Thanks for, thanks for joining our team. Um, you're going to like Gabe because when he puts together our service orders, he puts how long everything should take. And he put down 35 minutes next to my sermon, and I'm probably, I'm on the clock already too, right? Like all this wedding sniffling nonsense. So man, he's going to probably save you 15 or 20 minutes of your life every week, and uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my best to, uh, to, work, to work with that. Let's jump into it since we're on the clock. Uh, it's, it's Palm Sunday, and we're talking about uh, engaging Easter. And today I want to I talk a little bit about anticipation. I, I want you to think about your life for just a moment. When's the last time that you were really pumped about something? I mean, you were, you were really excited. You were really looking forward to it. There was a, a high level of expectancy and anticipation. I want you to capture that in your mind. Hopefully it wasn't that long ago. I think we always need something that we're excited about and something that we're looking forward to in our life. I've got things on my radar already. But, but for me personally, as I thought about the last thing that I just couldn't wait for it to get here, and I mentioned this last week, it was, it was the vacation that my family and I just got back from. Uh, we hadn't really taken a, a full week of vacation in a little while. We had gotten away for a few days here and there. Um, but over spring break, we ended up spending a week at the beach. We, we were so excited about this that we started searching for the place that we were going to stay months and months and months ago. We usually tend to be pretty last minute, but Nicole said, we, our family needs a vacation. We need to get away, like those old Southwest uh, Airlines commercials. And she said, let's get, something, let's get something booked. And so, man, we booked this way in advance. And then as the days got closer and closer, we had Monday through Saturday booked at the condo that we were supposed to stay in. And I said, honey, our plan is kind of to, to leave after church on Sunday. Would you, would you be interested in leaving earlier? And she said, absolutely. What's the earliest that we can leave? And so we looked at the calendar, and Addison had a soccer game on Saturday morning. And so we just made the decision, man, as soon as that soccer game is over, we're going to get in the van. We're going to start our, our journey towards the vacation. We, we were pumped about it. And, and because there was a high level of excitement and energy, anticipation, uh, we, we just couldn't wait for it. Uh, we, were, we were looking forward to some relaxing time. We set our agenda that our goal was to do as little as possible, for it to be the slowest, most relaxing, most low-key vacation that we have ever taken as a family. We got home and I talked to, to a family that went to Disney World for vacation, and they were exhausted. And I was so grateful that our family had chosen to take a different route. Our only desire was to get away and be on the beach and enjoy that time together 
with our family. And I, like I said, I booked a condo months in advance. And about a month before we were supposed to leave, I got a kind of an unassuming email from the vacation group that I had booked with that there might be some disruption to our vacation because of some remodeling that was happening at our condo. The email said the following items could, the following areas could be impacted. The parking lot might not have availability for parking. The pool will not be available for you to use. You might not be able to go out onto your balcony and access the balcony, and the boardwalk to the beach will be closed. And I said, that's, that's the whole vacation. That's, that's the whole thing. You, you park, you go in your condo, you use the pool, you go down to the beach, and when you're not at the beach, you sit on the balcony and you enjoy the beach from the balcony. And so I sent him an email and I said, this sounds like uh, quite a bit of uh, disruption. I will need more information about the level that all of these things are going to affect my vacation. And so I uh, call, ended up calling them and talking with them, and they were trying to get all the details together in two weeks before we were supposed to go on that trip, they called me and they said, sir, we have to cancel your condo. Uh, you're not, not gonna be able to stay there because it is a full-blown shutdown. They're not even using the buildings. In fact, when we ended up going down, I drove through the place that we had originally rented and it was 100% hard hat construction site. Like nobody was staying there anytime soon. I don't even know if they're gonna make it in time for summer. So they said, what we gotta do is we've either gotta cancel you or we've gotta move you. And now we're pretty close to vacation. And so they ended up moving us from where we were supposed to stay to a completely different community in a much slower and a much quieter, a very uh, not as desirable part of the, of the, of the Gulf Coast. Uh, but I'll be honest with you, a part that isn't quite as desirable was, was, still, was still pretty great. In that moment, I could have decided to get annoyed. Uh, in fact, that's probably what I would normally do. I, I could have decided that I was going to get frustrated I could have decided that that vacation wasn't going to measure up to everything that we had wanted it to be. I could have decided that, that it wasn't going to meet all of our expectations because the place that we were planning to stay wasn't where we were going to stay and we got sent somewhere else. Not, not only that, but we started watching the weather as the days got closer and a major cold front was coming through, if you remember spring break. And so we, we realized that, man, when we get down there, it's going to be in the 50s for the first couple days. And then we're going to warm up into the 60s, and it's not going to get into the 70s until like Wednesday afternoon. We, we, we got to our vacation, and we spent the first two days in like jeans and sweatshirts and sweaters and jackets, and it was completely different than any other trip that we had ever taken to the beach. We could have let all of those factors ruin that vacation. We could have decided to focus on all of the things that were wrong, but we had already determined this is going to be the best vacation that we've ever taken. This is going to be the most relaxing time that we've ever spent together. It doesn't matter if it's sunny and beautiful and we stay in a perfect place or if it's cloudy and cold and rainy and our place is a dump. We're going to love this time together. Turns out the place wasn't a dump. It was actually probably nicer than the place that we had originally rented. It also turns out that when it's cold on the beach, it's way better than when it's warm at the beach. Has anybody ever experienced this? Now, when you think about going to the beach, you think about it being 90 degrees and clear skies and blazing hot and you're covered in sunscreen. Church, let me tell you, it is way better to sit on the beach in a hoodie and some sweatpants and no sunscreen than it is to be covered from head to toe in sunscreen sitting there in your underwear. I promise you. If you haven't tried it before, try it. Go to the beach when it's cold. Don't put on any sunscreen. Cover up everything and just soak it all in. It is fantastic. We were excited about that. And it was actually our expectations and that sense of anticipation. It was that excitement that we felt that set the bar for what we were going to experience on vacation. We, we made the decision. We made a choice to expect a fantastic vacation. And we experienced a fantastic vacation. And sometimes I wonder if the expectations that we have of God could potentially be set a little too low. That, that we don't really show up anticipating him to move and work in powerful, meaningful, and significant ways. We, we don't really have any expectancy that this Sunday is going to be any different than last Sunday, which is any different than the Sundays that came up years ago. I, I think sometimes we set the bar of anticipation and excitement low with God, and we oftentimes miss out on what God wants to do. Because here's the thing, God doesn't change. The, the word tells us, his word tells us that he is faithful and that he is true, that he never changes, that he is the same yesterday and today and forever. You know what that means? That means God is always going to show up. God is always going to do his thing. God is always going to do things that only he can do. God is going to do his thing 
and how you experience him doing his thing will depend on your attitude, your expectation, and the sense of anticipation that you bring. Say, Pastor Tim, what are you talking about? I'm saying if you don't expect God to do anything, he's not going to do anything. But if you anticipate that when you show up and you engage with the body of Christ and you cry out to him, you seek him, you worship him, when you expect God to move and work in powerful ways, God moves and he works in powerful ways. Church, today I would say when we expect little of him, we experience little in our life. But when we expect much, we experience great things from God. And I think this Palm Sunday is a great example of that. And I know on Palm Sunday when we, when we talk, you know, you come to church every Palm Sunday and it's kind of always the same passage of Scripture. And I promise you we're going to get there. But, but before we talk about Palm Sunday today, I, I want us to just rewind just a little bit. I, I don't know if you've ever thought about the Saturday night before Palm Sunday, but it, but it was an interesting encounter that Jesus had. In fact, I think the, the encounter that Jesus has in John chapter 12 on Saturday night, it kind of sets the bar and sets the tone for what's about to happen during that triumphal entry into Jerusalem. If, if you're reading along in John chapter 12, I just want to give you this one verse at the beginning of, of that triumphal entry, entry passage that we always read. It says, the next day the great crowd had come to the festival that Jesus was on. The, the next day the great crowd had come to the festival, heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem the next day. And I think it's interesting that John says that it's the next day, because if it's the next day, what happened the previous day could actually be, be meaningful. It could be significant. It, it could be important. So what I'm going to actually do is I want to back us up, and we're going to go in this living room with Jesus and a group of people that he's gathered with in John chapter 12, verse 1. It sounds like it's important, so let's take a look. And it says, six days before Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here, a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served, while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Hard stop. Pause right here. This is after Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. How cool would this dinner party be to be at, right? You got a guy who was dead for several days <laughs> and the son of God <laughs> hanging out around this table. Like, man, get me, get me tickets for that dinner. I want to I RSVP. I'm definitely going to be there. So Lazarus is just kicking it at the table with the king of kings and the lord of lords and the savior of all humanity. And it says that then Mary took a pint of pure nard and expensive perfume and she poured it on Jesus' feet, and she wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of beautiful perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who would later betray him, objected. Why, isn't this perf- why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It's worth a year's wages. He didn't say that because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And as the keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. It's an interesting situation, isn't it? How how many of us can just agree? That would have been a crazy night to go to that dinner party, right? You got the dead guy talking about, yeah, I was dead, and then I heard somebody calling my name, and I had to say, come forth, and I didn't really even want to, but man, I came forth, and and it was crazy. I mean, this, this situation with Lazarus, this is what everybody is talking about in, in this community. That this man who was dead is now back to life. And so now you've got the dead man and the guy who raised him here at the table. And you've got a sister there at this dinner party. And it's not, not at her house, but she is filled with so much gratitude. There's so much thankfulness in Mary's heart that she can't contain it. You can tell that she thought ahead and and she planned and she knew when she went to this dinner that Jesus was going to be there and she showed up at that dinner with a heart that was full of worship. She didn't come for a meal. She came to worship at the feet of Jesus. She couldn't contain everything that was going on inside of her. And so she asked, man, what is the most extravagant display that I can do to try to say thank you to Jesus for who he is and for all that he has done and as she's there taking this expensive perfume and pouring it on Jesus almost this act of anointing before all of these activities that lead him to the cross there are some of those in the room that feel like well this is a little awkward this is a little uncomfortable 
This is a little extravagant. This feels a little over the top. But it's all coming from a heart of love. It's all coming from a place of gratitude. It's all coming as an expression of worship for Mary. And as she, as, yeah, for Mary. And as she's pouring this out, literally pouring this out on Jesus, you got Judas over there with his arms crossed, completely missing out on the moment. Mar- Mary. I'm getting these sisters mixed up today. Mary showed up with an agenda that she was there to worship Jesus that night. Judas also had an agenda. And as he's followed Jesus for the last three years now, he's realizing over and over and over again that the Jesus agenda and the Judas agenda don't match up. And this is the moment where all of that comes to head. And Judas is so frustrated. He's like, I've had enough. I'm not doing this anymore. That's expensive perfume. It's wasteful that it would be poured out on Jesus. We could have helped a lot of people with that money. And, and you know, John kind of knows the heart of Judas. Yeah, sure, maybe he could have skimmed a little bit off of the top. But what we find is that Jesus isn't who Judas expected him to be. And, and when Jesus isn't who we expect him to be, when Jesus' agenda doesn't line up with our agenda, it creates friction in our life. We either expect that Jesus will make an adjustment to his life or it requires that we would make an adjustment to our life when our agenda and Jesus' agenda don't match. And so here we have some of the cast of characters. We've got Jesus, Son of God, Lazarus, raised from the dead, Mary, heart filled with gratitude, pouring it out at the, on the head and on the feet of Jesus. You've got Judas with his agenda and he's ticked off. And other writers tell us that this dinner is actually happening at the house of a Pharisee named Simon. In, in Luke we read that they turned to the woman and said to si- that he turned to the woman and he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and she wiped them with his hair, with her hair. You didn't even give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. And now what we see Jesus doing very clearly is he is contrasting the way that he was welcomed into Simon's home by Simon who didn't wash his feet and didn't put oil in his head on his head which are both basic things that a gracious host would do for visiting guests in a culture that's that's so focused on hospitality this is like the bare minimum that you would rinse off the dirty feet of your guests and that you would put this oil on their head as as part of them coming to your home but simon hasn't done any of that and now simon is mad at this extravagant display from mary and jesus is like look at her You could learn something from her. I showed up in your house and you didn't care. I showed up in your house. You offered no hospitality. You offered no welcome to me. But her, she has treated me like the guest of honor since the moment I walked through the door, wetting my feet with her tears, pouring this perfume upon my head. He says, Simon, I'm supposed to be the guest of honor in your house, but you're acting like you're still the guest of honor here. You're acting like I'm doing you a favor by showing up when I'm supposed to be the one who's been invited to be here. He said, since I walked through the door, I have been received with anticipation and expectancy and love and adoration from Mary, and you, you have completely ignored the fact that I'm even here. And it's not just a story about something that happened 2,000 years ago. I think every single time we come into an encounter with Jesus, we have the opportunity to ask ourselves, am I going to worship Jesus like Simon? Or am I going to worship Jesus like Mary? Am I going to have an extravagant heart that's filled with adoration and love and worship that doesn't mind if I look silly to everybody else in the room? I'm here to worship him. Or am I going to be the one who goes, well, it looks like church is coming up. I guess I'll honor Jesus with my presence today. They can count me and the church can be grateful that I showed up today. And church, I love you. I love our church. I think you're amazing people. I think this is an amazing place. But I don't want us to be a church of a bunch of entitled religious people who gather and think we're doing Jesus a favor. 
I want us to be the kind of church that is filled with people that have the heart of Mary, who understand that He has done more for us than we could ever do for Him, who has offered an extravagant gift, not just raising Lazarus from the dead, but laying His life down and conquering death Himself so that we can take hold of life and live for all eternity. How can we show up in the place without even offering Jesus to wash His feet or put oil on His head? We come into this place and we say, Jesus, here's everything that we have here's all my heart all my soul all my spirit all my life all my love all my adoration it all belongs to you because you're the only one that's worthy you're the only one that's deserving so i offer to you everything that i have as a gift of worship and it still feels inadequate because of who you are and because of all that you have done that's a crazy saturday night y'all that's a wacky dinner party The night before, he says. And John continues in verse 9. It says, meanwhile, this big crowd found out that Jesus was there. And they came not only because of him, but also they wanted to see Lazarus, right? How many of you are like, I'm not going to lie, I'd be in the same boat. Like, hey, where's that guy that died, came back? Yeah, I definitely definitely want to meet him. Lazarus had been raised from the dead. It says, so the chief priest made plans to kill Lazarus as well. This is as well as Jesus. So now it's like a, like a double hit kind of job. It's Lazarus and Jesus. They both have to go. They want to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, many Jews were coming to Jesus and believing in him. I, I want you to pay attention to the significance of this. Because you look at Jesus' ministry and for three years it's all public. He's, he's teaching in public. He's healing in public. In fact, he even points this out when they come to arrest him, right? He's like, hey, why are you guys doing this in the middle of the night? I've, I've, been, I've been wide open. I haven't had anything to hide from you my whole life. But from, from, from the miracles to the teaching to the life to the love that he has displayed, up until this point, it's, it's all felt somewhat, somewhat subtle and, and somewhat understated. But man, when Jesus calls a dead man out from the grave, he throws down the gauntlet. The, the, the resurrection of Lazarus from the dead by, by Jesus, this is the catalyst to the cross for Jesus. This is, the, this is the line in the sand. This is the moment when the religious powers that be, that feel threatened by Jesus, this is the moment when they say, we can't let this guy be around anymore. He's, he's too disruptive. He's caused too much trouble. And the crowds have been captivated with Jesus for a long time. And there have been whispers of hope along the way that maybe this is the guy. Maybe he's the promised one. Maybe he's the one that we have been waiting for. But after Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, that whisper of hope becomes a roar of the crowd of adoration and anticipation. And there's no turning back for this moment, from that moment for Jesus. From that moment forward, it is eyes fixed on the cross, heart resolutely set on the mission that God has sent him for. There was no turning back. And the thought that Jesus could have been the Messiah that might have felt absurd or too good to believe for a long time now felt like it could be an actual reality, that this might actually be true, that he might be the guy. And so now you've got Lazarus and you've got Jesus and you've got everybody talking and the rumble of that crowd is roaring and the powers that be are getting unsettled and it's time for Jesus to go into Jerusalem. And this is that Hosanna moment that we always read about. It says the next day, the great crowd that gathered, they came to the festival and they heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and they went out to meet him shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. And it says that Jesus found a young donkey and he sat on it as it is written, do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. Your king is coming. He is seated on a donkey's Colt, and this would have been such an incredible crowd to be a part of, right? I mean, like if you told me that I could have a ticket to dinner with Jesus and Lazarus or be a part of that electric crowd on the triumphal entry, I don't know which one of those offers I would actually would have taken. I would have said, Can I do both? You know, like I would have it would be amazing to be at either one of these places. Have you ever have you ever been in a crowd of people that are just filled with hope and anticipation? 
I mean, a, a group of people who are just completely excited. Maybe it was even in a, in a worshipful experience where you know everybody came hungry and everybody came ready. Almost like what we were following along on that Asbury revival with when you looked at that crowd of people and it was just so obvious that the Spirit of God was at work and the, and the Spirit was on the move. Come on, let's be honest. There's some electricity when a crowd of people get together with all of their hopes and all of their dreams and all of their anticipation and all of their expectations all focused in the same direction. You know, I started out talking about about vacation, and, and it was an amazing thing. On the Thursday night of vacation, and I don't want to raise up any hard feelings. I know there's still healing that needs to happen for some of us, but on Thursday night, there was an Arkansas Razorback game, and we kind of randomly decided with some friends that were down in the area as well that we would meet them at this place called the Big Chill where they have this giant LED screen to watch the basketball game. We thought that might have been a quaint or a unique idea. It was not. Everybody down in, on the panhandle of Florida that week was from Arkansas. And they all went to the Big Chill to watch the Arkansas game. We talked to one of the workers, and they said, this is the busiest this place has ever been. And I bet there were more than 5,000 Arkansas fans just filling this kind of outdoor space at this kind of shopping and restaurant entertainment area. And it was electric. There was so much hope. There was so much expectancy. There was so much anticipation. Remember, we had just beat a number one seed in Kansas. We were pumped. And then the game started. <laughs> and as we sat there, we talked about what could have been. We talked about how amazing this environment would have been if this would have actually been a competitive basketball game. Because even when we were down by 20, if we hit a three or we got a turnover, it wasn't a lot of those, but if we did, man, that crowd went crazy. But there wasn't really a lot to cheer for. But man, on this day, for this crowd... In this moment, as Jesus comes into Jerusalem with the hopes of generations hanging in the air, that this might actually be the guy, it's Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. And Jesus is welcomed as a humble king. But here's the problem with this situation. The Jesus that this crowd is welcoming into Jerusalem isn't actually who Jesus is. They expect Jesus to be someone that he isn't. They expect him to be a conquering military kind of ruler and king. They expect him to bring down the power of Rome who has occupied and who rules them. They think that Rome is the problem, but Jesus isn't there to solve a Rome problem. He's there to solve a human problem. He's there to deal with a sin problem. That they want him to conquer their foes, but Jesus is actually coming to surrender his life as an atoning sacrifice for their sin, for your sin, for my sin, and for the sin of all humanity. They have imposed their agenda upon Jesus, and this crowd of people will end up as disappointed as 5,000 people at the Big Chill watching Arkansas get run in the ground by Yukon. Because Jesus isn't who they expected him to be. And if you can think about what it would have been like for the hopes to have been so high on Sunday and then to see him hanging on a cross on Friday, he didn't meet up their agenda. They, they were disappointed and their disappointment was squarely in Jesus. Something, something dangerous happens when we come to Jesus with our agenda. When we, when we come to him and we expect him to kind of align himself with us, to, to think like us, to believe like us, to act like us, to operate like us, it, it's a dangerous thing. It, it's, it's really hard for us to come to Jesus with a blank slate and surrender our agenda to his. It's, it's dangerous when we bring our agenda and we say, Jesus, I want you to fit into this because what happens when we impose our agenda in Jesus is we're trying to create Jesus in our likeness, and we're never called or instructed to make Jesus like us. We're always called and instructed that we would make our lives like his. We don't make Jesus in our likeness. We are transformed into the likeness of Christ when we lay our agenda and our expectations and our hopes and our dreams and all of those things that we think it should be. When we're come to the place where we can say, Jesus, this is everything that I've got wrapped up, but I want to lay it down, and all I want is you. 
in what you want and what you desire for me and for the world around me. I surrender my agenda to yours. We like it when Jesus' agenda is the same as ours. And it's way too easy to force him into our agenda rather than surrender our agenda to him. I, I put this formula together earlier this week, and I, and I struggled with the words a little bit, and the band is going to come, and we're going we're gonna to close with a song today. It says, anticipation plus expectancy minus our agenda, that, that's what leads to transformation. But let, let me explain this for just a second. When you take a sense of anticipation, it's that, it's that growing swell of hope and excitement. That, man, God is going to move. He's going to work. He's going to do something. And we're not like, ah, maybe if he's not too busy. Or, or potentially if everything works out right and we sing the right songs and Pastor Tim doesn't preach too long and he doesn't get too distracted. and may, Maybe, maybe. No, man, when we're filled with anticipation and we bring a true spirit of expectancy and we say, Jesus, I don't know how you're going to move. I don't know how you're going to work. I don't know what you're going to do. I've got ideas in my mind, but what I want to do is I want to lay down all of my preconceived ideas and notions about who you are and how you should work. I'm going to lay those things down to give you freedom to move and work in my life. And when we take a little bit of anticipation and we pair it up with some expectancy and we surround under our agenda, that's when we see transformation. Other words that I had here is that's when we see revival. That's when we see an outpouring of his spirit. It's anticipation plus expectation minus agenda. That's when we experience a profound move of God in our life, in our church, and in our midst. God, I expect and I anticipate that you're going to move and you're going to work, and I don't want to get in the way. I don't want my limiting ideas about who you are or what you can do to restrict how you're going to move and work. So I lay my agenda down so that your agenda can be lifted high. I read a verse from Psalm, and I love it actually in the King James Version, which I don't go to very often, but in Psalm 62 it says this. It says, My soul wait thou only upon God. My expectation is from him. I love the idea of a soul that's just leaning in, filled with anticipation, understanding that all of our expectation is coming only from him. It says, he is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. It's anticipation and expectancy and surrendered agenda. And it's a transformative and profound move and work of God in our lives. And so then I've got just a couple of questions for you. My, my, my question is, are you expecting Jesus to fit into your agenda or are you willing to lay down your agenda to take hold of his? I feel like it's possible that some of us could be in this place and we might be disappointed with Jesus because he hasn't done what we thought he was going to do. He hasn't moved when we thought he should move. And what he has done, he didn't do it the way that we thought he was going to do it. And we had hoped for this one thing, but Jesus did this other thing, and, and today maybe we're a little let down. Maybe, maybe we came into this place and there really wasn't a lot of anticipation. There wasn't really a lot of expectancy. In fact, for some of us, maybe it's been weeks or months or years or decades since we've truly leaned in with the hungering spirit that says, God, I long for you. I need you. I want you. I anticipate. In fact, I expect that you're going to show up, that you're not going to disappoint, that you're not going to let us down, but you're going to move and work in our church, in our life, in our community, in my family, in my neighborhood in a profound way, and I don't want to miss it. And so today, my prayer for you is that you would engage with Easter, that, that you would anticipate, that you would take time to contemplate, that we would get together and that we would celebrate. My, my prayer is that your heart and your soul and your spirit would be filled with a sense of anticipation and expectancy that you can't bottle up and contain, but you've got to pour it out like Mary poured out that perfume upon the head of Jesus. My prayer for you is that you would set aside your own ideas, your own agenda about who Jesus is, who he should be, what he should do, and how he should do it, and that you would truly have a heart that's filled with worship and gratitude to him. And today we're going to close with a song. 
And it's a simple song. It says, I'm sorry when I've made following you into things that it's not supposed to be. And all I want is you and nothing else. What that means, it means that we're going to be people who live with the spirit of surrender, that we will lay our agenda down, that we'll come to Jesus with ourself, with a contrite heart, with a surrendered spirit, and nothing else so that we can truly engage with him and worship him. And I don't know how you respond in this moment. Maybe the Spirit has spoken to you and maybe challenged your heart. Maybe this is a prayerful response kind of moment. Our altars are always open. You're welcome to come and you're welcome to pray. Maybe this is just a moment of of confession and just the words of this song could be the prayer of your heart. I'm going to ask God to take this time and make it His, and I'm going to ask you to stand with me as we prepare to close with this song. Jesus, I thank you. I thank you for this day. I thank you for these people. I thank you for this place, and I thank you for this moment because we believe that you are here. Lord, today, maybe some of us need to reawaken or allow you to reawaken a sense of expectancy and hopeful anticipation. Lord, maybe today is a day when some of us need to confess about the agendas that we've tried to impose upon you. Maybe today is a day that some of us need to look at our lives and say, man, I'm more like Simon, or God forbid, more like Judas than I am like Mary. God, I pray that in these final moments of this service that you would give each of us a worshiper's heart like Mary, that we would pour out our worship before you, that it would be pleasing to you. And God, I pray that you would take this time, make it yours, move and work in this place, however you see fit, we pray in Jesus' name. Caught up in your presence And I just want to sit here at your feet. I'm caught up in this holy moment. I never want to leave. And I'm not here for blessings. No, Jesus, you don't owe me anything. More than anything that you can do, I just want you. And I'm sorry. When I've just gone through the motions, I'm sorry. And I just sang another song, so take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you. And I'm sorry. When I come with my agenda, I'm sorry. When I forgot that you're enough, so take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you. I'm caught up in your presence. And I just want to sit here at your feet. I'm caught up in this holy moment. I never want to leave. Oh, I'm not here for blessings. No, Jesus, you don't owe me anything. And more than anything that you can do, I just want you. We're setting aside all else, saying, I just want you. And I just want you. And nothing else. And nothing else, nothing else will do, Lord, 
Cause I just warn you and nothing else and nothing else and nothing else will do Lord and I just warn you and nothing else no nothing else and nothing else will do and I just warn you and nothing else oh nothing else and nothing else will do is I just warn you and nothing else and nothing else, nothing else will do, Lord, because I just warn you, not fair, not money. Nothing else, nothing else, oh, nothing else will do, Lord, because I just warn you, and nothing else, Lord. No, nothing else, nothing else will do, Lord. I just want you, not the social status, nothing else, oh, not the money, nothing else, oh, not the glory, nothing else will do, oh, I just want you, and nothing else, Lord, nothing else. Nothing else, nothing else will do. Cause I'm caught up in your presence. Oh, and I just want to sit here at your feet. I'm caught up in this holy moment. I never want to leave. Amen. We're going to close with a word of prayer today. And I'm going to invite Gabe to move from the keys down to, uh, to the altar, maybe just down on this side, if you don't mind. And Anna and Gabby, if you wouldn't mind joining them. They've got another son, Copeland, who I believe maybe goes by Coco a lot of the time. And uh, today we're just going to pray over this family as an act of installation as they join our team. I'd love to invite uh, some folks to gather around them, maybe our church board, and really just uh, anybody that wants to lay a hand on a, on a shoulder. And it's a privilege to have uh, Dr. Lindstrom with us today. I didn't get a heads up on this, I didn't say anything ahead of time, but would you mind praying over Gabe? Maybe the two of us will do that. So Dr. Lindstrom, if you want to come down and join us also, that would be great. Let's gather around and pray over this family today. Lord, what a privilege it is to, for us to gather around Gabe today. Thank you, for God, for the day that you called him and he said yes. And thank you for the way that, that his ministry has been affirmed by the church over these years. Congregations that he's blessed and served. And Lord, we're thankful for the privilege to be able to welcome him to back to North Arkansas and to Conway First Church where... The blessings that Gabe has given to other ministries can now be shared with ours. Yes, Jesus. So, Lord, we just pray that this time would be just ministerially refreshing for him, a joy. We pray, God, that not only would we, we, we be the recipients of the blessings he gives to us, but we pray, God, that his, him and his family's involvement here in this place would be a blessing for them as well. That's right. Yes, Jesus. I pray, God, that his wife and his children see this as some of the greatest days of their life, Lord, the time they share with us. So, Lord, I pray for this congregation and Pastor Tim as they surround this family and care for them. I pray, Lord, that it would be just mutually edifying, Lord, as they work together and partner together to bring your kingdom to bear in this place. 
We love you, Jesus. We thank you for your gifts and graces. We thank you for your calling. Yes, Jesus. And God, we just celebrate it today. And we do so in your wonderful name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Father, today as we continue, we thank you so much for the Cox family. We thank you that in your timing, you've brought them here to Conway, Lord. I thank you for the fruitful ministry that they've had in BB and at Camp Table Rock and most recently in Carthage. And God, I know that congregation is uh, hurting today and they're making the adjustment. So I pray that you would draw near to them as they feel the void of this family leaving. God, I pray today that as we have laid hands on the shoulders and on the back of these people, that they would understand that they've got a church family that's going to love them, care for them, and support them. God, I pray that we wouldn't get caught up in petty things that don't matter, but that we'd be able to focus on the mission that you've called us on. God, I pray that as he leads us in worship, that you would lead him. I know first and foremost, he wants to be a worshiper of you, and I thank you for his humble spirit. I thank you for his gifts, but God, I pray that he would come to you with a surrendered heart and God, I pray that this would be an incredible place. I pray that he would see fruit from his ministry. I pray that there would be a great harvest in and through our church. God, I pray that you would be with him as he pours into our worship team and our tech team and our church family. And God, I pray that he wouldn't do that from a place that's empty and dry. But God, I pray that springs of living water would flow in him from a fresh encounter with you. And God, I pray that this place of ministry would be a place where he finds a healthy balance, that it would be a place that's life-giving, that there is joy, that there is um, life and, and hope. And God, I just pray that you would draw this family close to you during this next few weeks as he runs back and forth some. God, I pray that you would be with Anna and with the kids. And I pray that you would be with Gabe as well. I pray that you would keep him safe as he travels and that you would watch over him. And God, I pray that you would be with them as they make all these uh, decisions that come along with moving from finding a house to jobs to schools and all of those things. And God, I pray that they would thrive in relationships in our church and in our community. And I pray that they would find that Conway is a great place to make their home and that you would affirm this call in their life, that it would be proven that this is where you want them in the center of your will. And God, I pray that there would be great, powerful and effective ministry for Gabe and for this family. God, we believe that you have great things ahead. We have expectation we have anticipation and we lay down our agenda and we say, God, the pieces are in place. So you do what you want to do. You move and work. And God, we invite you to blow us away with how you're going to move and work in this chapter of ministry at Conway First Church of the Nazarene. And I'm not going to get in the way of the glory. And I know that Gabe's not either. So we're going to give you all the glory and the honor and the praise for what we believe and expect and know that you're going to do. We love you and we pray these things in Jesus name. And all God's people said together, amen. amen. <coughs> Oh, there's that cough I warned you about. I tried to tell you. I tried to tell you. Nothing like taking a good spiritual moment and just coughing right into it. All right, man. Uh, we are going to wrap up our service this morning, but we don't want you to leave. I hope that you will stay. We cooked enough food for probably all the Nazarene churches on the North Arkansas District. And so stay. We've got to break down some tables, some chairs. We've got to put up some tables. But it's going to be a great time of fellowship. There is a basket in the back. If you brought something for the family that you want to share, you can drop that in there. If you're going, have a great day. But don't go. Let's stay and enjoy this time together. God bless you. Have an amazing week.